day to everyone. Today, I am privileged to open this scientific session entitled A Metrics-Based Evaluation of One Health Toward Control of Vector-Borne Diseases in the Context of Climate Change in Africa. The Special Program for Research and Training for Tropical Diseases is very pleased to jointly co-organize this scientific session with Fondation Bariou as both institutions that advocate for One Health as a field of research and practice to address infectious diseases of poverty among vulnerable populations. Today, we bring together several speakers with vast experience and expertise in the fields of EcoHealth and One Health. This session aims to further articulate the fundamentals of One Health as well as to draw insights into the conduct of integrative research using One Health transdisciplinary systems approaches, including a scorecard metrics-based evaluation for its operationalization. At this point, allow me to introduce this session's co-chair, Dr. Valentina sanchez Pico. Valentina is with the Fondation Mergu, where she is the scientific and research advisor and head of clinical research. She has led numerous international multi-center research studies on lower acute respiratory infections and emerging diseases including Ebola and other infectious diseases like rabies and cholera in affected countries, including those in crisis settings in refugee camps. And finally, I'd like to introduce myself as the other co-chair for this session. I'm Bernadette Ramirez, a scientist with a special program for research and training for tropical diseases based at headquarters of the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. I coordinate and manage TDR's work in the area of vector-borne diseases in the context of the changing environment, including climate change. TDR's current work are focused on research capacity building for operationalizing One Health in Africa. Now that we have given this preliminary introduction to the scientific session, let us continue on with the presentations. Thank you very much. Dear Bernadette, thank you so much for the kind introduction. It is a pleasure for me to co-chair this session. As we will hear from our honorable speakers, the session depicts insights on implementation research around the concept of One Health, identifying principles and capacities to operationalize One Health practices in complex systems at the human-animal-environmental interface. We will observe the experience from the TDR-IDRC Africa Initiative in integrating the One Health fundamentals in various projects promoting its development by putting into practice the application of this methodological framework. Fundación Meriu is an independent, non-lucrative foundation committed to fighting infectious diseases affecting principally developing countries. We are most grateful to have the opportunity to be part of this exchange with you all. Thank you. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome the first speaker of this session, Professor Bruce Wilcox. Professor Wilcox is Director and Senior Scientist at Global Health Group International and holds adjunction professorships at several leading universities. He is recognized as pioneer researcher and founder of the interdisciplinary fields conservation biology and ecology and health, including their societies and journals, conservation biology and eco-health. He formerly held faculty positions at Stanford University and the University of Hawaii. Good day. I'm pleased to make the opening presentation of the technical portion of this session, which is entitled Fundamentals of One Health the operational challenge to intervention design and implementation. One Health represents the call for a new paradigm. So what is that new paradigm? Well, that new paradigm is one that challenges the areas of health and allied fields to provide a basis for integration of health sciences and practices, mainly with those of environmental management and ecology. 
its aim is to better understand and manage health and disease at the so-called human-animal environment interface. As many of you are familiar, the proponents of One Health beginning about 15 years ago when One Health was first term was first coined, repeatedly point to the need to focus on the so-called human-animal environment interface. So this is a key tenet of One Health, but it remains to be operationalized uh, in terms of describing what is actually meant by that and what kinds of disciplinary and generally knowledge domains uh, need to be brought in to understand what is meant by that. So clearly, part of what is meant by that is, as you can see in the bottom of this slide, is that we know that zoonotic diseases, whether endemic, whether emerging, uh, new diseases, uh, whether epidemic diseases, for example, the Aedes aegypti uh, vector diseases, which you could see somewhat from this uh, slide in the bottom, uh, involve landscapes, landscapes that, for example, can be described in terms of a gradient from on the left, the urban, to on the far right of this uh, picture on the bottom, to the syllatic or rural wild species, for example, cycles. So we know that in order to understand zoonotic diseases, and particularly to understand the emergence of zoonotic diseases, we need to understand them in this context of where human populations, host species, and when vectors are involved, and of course, uh, microbes that are involved all interact together. So that's the real challenge of uh, One Health. So what this means is that we need to articulate this fundamentals, the idea of the, the principles and formulation of testable hypotheses. And we need to do this in the context of implementation research, aiming at these proposed principles that underlie the One Health approach. So this is basically a fundamentals imperative that is being called for. Imagine a, a textbook called Fundamentals of One Health. This is what we need to move towards. So this is what we need, for example, that people could utilize to develop core competencies, those people who are going to be researchers and practitioners of One Health, or already are. Thus, the basis for developing the knowledge and skills for One Health research and practice. So starting about seven or eight years ago, almost that long ago, a research initiative was uh, established by WHO TDR in partnership with the Canadian uh, International Development Research Council. It's centered at that time on EcoHealth. And there were a number of projects, uh, mainly four or five major projects, but here we are continuing with four of the projects that spanned four different countries. You can see the map in the right side, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, uh, a part of uh, what well, part of our we name as a country, but it involved the dryland habitats mostly. Baringo in Western Kenya, Serengeti at the border of Kenya and Tanzania, of course, working with a Maasai, uh, and then a project spanning three countries, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Mabira is an acronym that stands, that incorporates the idea of malaria, bilharzia, and so this initiative focused on several different zoonotic diseases, including what I just mentioned, as well as Rift Valley fever um, and other and malaria and so on. So the result of which was a network of more than 50 researchers from multiple disciplines and all these countries and more was created. And a remarkable uh, human resource, you might say. The result of which was a capacity building among this network as well as new insights and tools that linked disease ecology, epidemiology, and meteorology in novel ways. More than this, it involved the sharing of approaches to incorporating traditional knowledge across a wide range of environments from South Africa to, the, uh, to Western uh, Africa. It turns out that these very issues, uh, including particularly this focus on the human-animal environment, 
presents an extraordinary opportunity, of course, to build on this knowledge, but particularly now in the context of the challenges we see that we have as a result of the uh, failures in many ways of preparedness, adaptation, and other needs that were exposed uh, by the, that have been exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. So more than ever, we can see <clears throat> there's a need to uh, further develop, operationalize this One Health approach as we're describing it here. With that regard, let's describe a little bit about how these insights have uh, helped lay the groundwork to further develop then um, the methodology that was centered on EcoHealth toward a One Health methodology, which of course focuses specifically on zoonotic diseases. Uh, the first of these is, is really the opportunity to conduct integrative research explicitly employing transdisciplinary and systems approaches. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. And secondly, uh, to utilize an implementation research approach, that is implementation research really is about methodological research and use that as the basis for One Health's validation. Without One Health's validation, it won't be possible to gain wider adoption. And of course, even if it is more widely adopted, it won't be possible to continually improve it without explicit operational criteria and evaluation metrics. So specifically, what we will do in this operational phase, building on the TDR, IDRC Africa initiative experience, which focused on one Health methodology is that we will create a One Health methodological framework. We will refine the criteria for multi-sectoral cross-disciplinary collaboration and integration. And we will develop an implementation research methodology that incorporates transdisciplinary uh, adaptive management process. Uh, in other words, this amounts to uh, setting up a framework, specific criteria and so on, upon which we can further develop this, this as a methodological approach. So it's really the problem of, of advancing the One Health approach in a way that we have specific, that is explicit criteria that can be challenged if necessary, uh, and that allow for repeatability. Therefore, the idea of, uh, of testing hypothesis, improving the methodology. In conclusion, really, the major impediments to advancing One Health have been this gap between the veterinary and human medicine science and practice on the one hand, and that between these health sciences and others, public health, and environmental and sustainability sciences. So you can see in this image, basically what we might describe as a human animal environment interface, a particular place-based social ecological system that is a human coupled natural system. And this is what we really need to understand better. It requires a systems approach, in fact, an ecosystem approach, but understanding that this is a coupled human natural system involves human institutions and societies making choices and decisions about how to intervene in problems of, say, disease control, and in turn, the reaction or the response that the natural system makes and then how the human social system responds. And so it's a cyclic uh, uh, reciprocal set of responses that are highly complicated, in fact, represent a complex adaptive system, which you'll hear more about in the next presentation. So what this will allow us to do in creating this framing and using this actual explicit description of what is a animal, a human animal environment interface, allow us to uh, develop research teams, including the stakeholders, all the way from the agency representative academic participation, as well as the participation of community members, those with local knowledge, uh, and so on, and transcend these disciplinary silos. In fact, we might even see, say, transcend 
knowledge domains generally and bridging these gaps towards a more uh, effective prevention and control of, of uh, approaches for zoonotic, including vector-borne diseases. So in general, the outcome of this should be not only improved prospects for health, that is for risk management and, and mitigation for zoonotic diseases, endemic zoonotic diseases, epidemic diseases, as well as emerging new diseases, also, it will address the general well-being of people, which, which is uh, an outcome of uh, the local approach to building local capacity, uh, including local resilience and so on, which contributes, of course, to sustainability in general. So, in conclusion, these are the outcomes that we expect, although we can assure you that it will take a number of years and continued work to refine what is a rather complicated approach, indeed more than complicated as you'll see in the next presentation, in that it uh, addresses what are complex adaptive systems. Uh, that is, we're dealing with a problem that is beyond the general controlled environment of the laboratory and the clinic to uh, the environment that involves transmission dynamics, uh, human populations, animal populations, host populations, micro populations, and so on, which places us in a completely different category of systems, that is, that is complex adaptive systems, which we'll hear more about in the next uh, presentation. most grateful to welcome the second speaker of this session, Dr. Carson Richer. Dr. Richer has been a research fellow with Global Health Group International since 2011. He received his doctoral degree in biology from the Graduate University of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. His expertise lies in infectious diseases, complex system theory, sustainable development, ecosystems, and one health approaches and project management. His research focuses on the organizational challenges of sustainable transdisciplinary management of, of infectious diseases using his managerial expertise to enrich ecosystems and One Health approaches with organizational principles and guidance. We are happy to welcome Dr. Kasten. Hello, my name is Carsten Richter. I'm with the Global Health Group International, and I welcome you to the session Capacity Building for a Metrics-Based Evaluation of One Health. A metrics-based evaluation of One Health is important because you can manage what you can measure. But what is it that we are trying to manage? One Health means that we are looking at a specific health issue of interest within a complex adaptive system at the inter-exchange of human, environmental, and animal health. The common One Health model is a high-level abstraction of the interface of the social economic, ecological, and livestock systems, each of which comprising of numerous subsystems on different scales interacting with each other. A metrics-based evaluation of One Health hence requires a systemic analysis of the health issue of interest. Since this may be indefinitely complex to do in a complex adaptive system, it requires an analysis specifically targeting the health issue of interest. What is more, because all the subsystems are constantly evolving, it also requires a continuous analysis of the health issue of interest within the complex adaptive One Health system. And because of the many interfaces between human, environmental, and animal health, it also requires a multidimensional, multi-scale, and finally, integrated analysis of the health issue of interest. Finally, the analysis should detail how the health issue arose and what is maintaining it in the system. Therefore, we require an analysis of the factors, circumstances, and drivers of the health issue of interest within the complex adaptive One Health system. For a complete analysis, however, we do not only need to identify and describe promoting factors, but also factors that are inherently protecting the system by making it less vulnerable to threats. 
Decreasing vulnerability means increasing resilience, which is the system's capacity to absorb, adapt, anticipate, and transform when exposed to external threats. Thereby, resilience may either be enforced or reduced as an effect of multi-scale interactions. So just as we need to analyze the promoting factors of a certain health issue, in the same way we need a targeted, continuous, multidimensional, multi-scale integrated analysis of factors, circumstances, and drivers of resilience within the system. Even with a thorough analysis, however, identifying metrics is not straightforward because of the properties of complex adaptive systems, namely nestedness, adaptiveness, nonlinearity, and emergence, which imply that the effects of a system's manipulation must be evaluated as a whole, rather than a direct cause-effect relationship as in complicated systems, for instance. That means any systems analysis must also consider and incorporate nested, adaptive, nonlinear, and emergent systems behavior, suggesting a trial and error research management style, or rather adaptive management, based on continuous knowledge generation and how to increase systemic resilience and decrease risk. A prerequisite for the ability to continuously perform an integrated systems analysis and adaptive management is the setup of a transdisciplinary organization. The core of transdisciplinarity is the full collaboration of all relevant disciplines and stakeholders for knowledge generation that is socially robust yet challengeable. Therefore, a metrics-based evaluation of One Health requires the setup of an integrative organization enabling and facilitating systems thinking and generative learning through a continuous transdisciplinary process of knowledge generation, application, and validation. For the adaptive management process, we start out with the Deming cycle of continuous improvement, comprising of the four phases, plan, do, check, and act, which for adaptive management have been extended to the six phases of assessing the problem, designing a solution, implementing it, monitoring the effects, evaluating the effects, adjusting the solution, and finally reassessing the problem. In a One Health approach, Adaptive management, unfortunately, is not that straightforward. First, in order to be able to even assess the problem, we need to set up a transdisciplinary organization, enable and facilitate systems thinking, and finally allow for multiple feedback loops for the recognition of new problems or even an adjustment of the organization itself. That means we require an adaptive management process challenging not only the current understanding of the systems as they evolve, but also the organizational capabilities to properly analyze and approach them. So, how do we set up a transdisciplinary organization able to sustainably evolve itself and manage One Health problems? The success of any organization depends on the core competencies that it develops and cultivates and that set it apart from failing efforts. Scorecards are a management tool to measure skills, processes, capacities, capabilities, performance and achievements related to those core competencies of an organization in order to be able to validate or adjust. In this project, we are developing a One Health scorecard to guide the setup and operations of transdisciplinary organizations aiming for sustainable risk management of One Health related threats. To summarize, in order to sustainably manage One Health related threats, we need an adaptive management process based on an integrated, continuous systems analysis performed by an evolving transdisciplinary organization with the organizational capacity to maintain those required core competencies of transdisciplinarity, systems thinking, generative learning, and adaptiveness. The One Health scorecard we are developing in this project will not only guide a respective organizational setup, but also evaluate whether such an organization is able to evolve appropriately with the systems it is aiming to manage. And that's it from my side. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer your questions. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Moses Chimbari. I'm a research professor at the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa, based in Deben. My presentation today is entitled Operationalizing One Health in Nguavuma Community, South Africa, Towards Building Systems Thinking 
and transdisciplinary competencies. I will start off by uh, discussing uh, a project that I call a legacy project. It's called MABISA, which stands for Malaria and Bilazia in Southern Africa. This project was part of uh, a consortium of projects that were funded by TDR, WHO uh, and IDRC from 2014 to 2018. Uh, the aim of those projects together was to contribute to reducing population health vulnerabilities and increase resilience against vector-borne diseases, risks under climate change conditions in Africa. My particular project uh, was contributing to this overall theme by assessing the impacts of multiple factors on malaria and schistosomiasis in communities that were semi-arid and were in Botswana, South Africa and Zimbabwe. This project, uh, the Mabisa project, was actually informed by a socio-ecological model uh, which helped us to develop a conceptual framework that I am about to present. So this conceptual framework looks at uh, the combined effects of environment, socioeconomic uh, situation and climate. Uh, and those combined effects, we looked at how they actually impact on VBDs given that VBDs, which are vector-borne diseases, were already a challenge in the region. And we realized that with what has been happening, the situation was getting aggravated. However, we felt that if we came up with uh, appropriate interventions, we would be able to reduce uh, the disease burden and community vulnerability to these uh, diseases. The project was implemented in Botswana, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. We chose the study sites because they had uh, many commonalities. Uh, they were generally uh, rural communities plagued with poverty. These communities had uh, a scarcity of water generally, and the people in these regions are all of uh, Bandu origin. And so these various sites from the different countries uh, presented more or less uh, the same kind of situation in terms of health. We used the eco-health approach, uh, which took into account uh, the total environment in terms of the social dimensions, the environment, uh, as well as uh, the climate changes. And we placed vector-borne diseases in the center, which means all analysis that we did took into account these three dimensions, and they were informed by the six pillars of eco-health, which range from transdisciplinarity via social and gender equity right to, through to knowledge to action. In implementing this uh, project, we started off with uh, project formulation, uh, which was uh, started off by a small team uh, where we had a workshop uh, to conceive this idea. And then we went to the field uh, to all the three uh, sites to see what the situation was like. And during those site visits, we were able to meet with the stakeholders and the communities. And we had meetings with them. Uh, and then we sold the idea of doing this project and the project was uh, accepted by the community. Once that project was accepted by the community, we then went ahead and uh, implemented it. And uh, our implementation phase involved multi-stakeholders and we followed the transdisciplinary approach and uh, we actually uh, emphasized a lot on uh, uh, gender equity and we used various tools, quantitative methodology and qualitative methodology uh, and throughout the journey we made sure that we capacitated the communities. Uh, we also uh, came up with uh, some new structures, which we called community advisory boards, who were actually our boundary partners between us and uh, the community that we were working in. And um, because of that, we were actually able to 
then implement the project and get useful outputs through our participatory or appraisal situation analysis reports, technical reports, police briefs, facts sheets, and we did a lot of publications. I want to emphasize the point that uh, this was an iterative process, as you can see from the arrows. Sometimes we actually uh, developed uh, new uh, research questions as we were implementing the project, uh, just as it was informed by our stakeholders. I would like to also emphasize that we're chasing a moving target uh, in the sense that in 2014, when we went to some sites, you can see right on the left, it's a dam full of water. But in 2018, it was completely dry. It's like there was nothing before. Uh, and the same situation, this particular site that you see here is the same site as you see on the uh, right. Uh, and the last one here also indicates that at one stage there was a thriving livelihood through vegetable gardening, but by 2018 there was nothing because it was completely dry. And therefore this is the reason why I said we kept on changing our research questions because we had to understand the environment better and the livelihoods of the people. From this project, uh, we were actually able to determine the spatial and temporal trends of schistosomiasis using both remote sensing and ground data. We were also able to find out what the perceptions of the communities on the influence of climate change uh, on malaria and schistosomiasis were. We also um, understood the influence of uh, socioeconomic, environment, climate, and institutional factors on the transmission dynamics uh, of the diseases. And together with the communities and our stakeholders, we were able to develop a framework uh, for stakeholder uh, adaptation, uh, which was aimed at reducing vulnerability to malaria and schistosomiasis. Uh, this project uh, generated a critical mass of young academics working on uh, climate change and on uh, vector borne diseases. We actually got six PhD degrees and three master's degrees out of that particular project. Uh, our capacity building was also extended to uh, the, the, the community itself by capacitating uh, community members. And we also uh, published a lot of our work uh, we continue to publish some of the work, but as of now, we're talking of 40 publications that came from that project. Our community engagement process, uh, which is now published by um, Sesengwa, one of the previous uh, PhD students, uh, actually demonstrated that uh, we have got uh, a before and uh, during uh, the study and an after study phase. So the first uh, phase was quite comprehensive, starting with the uh, uh, formative research and a lot of uh, consultation. And once that happened, we then moved into the middle uh, lane there, where we were now working with the communities uh, and the other stakeholders in the area to implement uh, uh, the, the, the study. And finally, we we're able to actually uh, identify areas where we could say that uh, we could build sustainability and ensure that once we we're gone, things continued moving. So this is a model that we think you know uh, can work, particularly in uh, uh, multi-country uh, projects like the one that uh, we had in the case of Mabisa. Uh, also. That process allowed us to move from just informing the communities to consulting them, involving them, and collaborating with them. And we believe that by the time we left the community, they had been uh, fully empowered in terms of uh, our research on schist and malaria. I would like to pause here and uh, acknowledge the people who made that project a success. And these were our collaborating institutions uh, our community members, our researchers, uh, and uh, WHO, which funded the project, not forgetting what we called the community research assistants, who actually drove the concept of citizen science. 
But something that was unique was the fact that we used artists and school children and journalists for dissemination of our information. I now would like to introduce the OPOHA project, which is operationalizing One Health in Africa, and I'll focus on the South African project. So I want to also start off by showing uh, our move from eco health to, to the One Health concept. So as I indicated earlier on, the eco health approach places health, human health in the center, and then we try to address uh, the health challenges in the context of the environment, uh, the socio, uh, the society, the community, and the economy. In other words, we look at the total uh, environment, socio-ecological environment, and try to understand the health dimension. When we look at uh, One Health, One Health is also looking at the environment, it's looking at the human health, and it's looking at animal health, and it's placing the One Health concept in the center. So you will find that there are a lot of similarities there, but uh, I want to uh, draw your attention to uh, the concept of transdisciplinarity, which is common between uh, these uh, two ways of, or these two approaches of uh, looking at health. So for eco-health ap uh, approach, you need a transdisciplinary team just as much as you would need one uh, for one health. So for the South African component of uh, OPOA, we, our objectives are actually related to the capacity development, knowledge and learning and threat management, uh, which is actually uh, common for all the three projects that are currently uh, being launched. So through that, we would like to actually enhance and develop capacity at different levels of operationalizing the One Health. We would also want to co-develop a theory of change with the stakeholders uh, to easily identify priority areas for research and intervention. And thirdly, we want to identify the hurdles to full empowerment of communities through co-development of an M&E framework. So if we look at uh, this uh, uh, framework, uh, as OPOA South Africa, we are going to look at the issue of capacitating our communities, capacitating our researchers, and making sure that our stakeholders are also capacitated in terms of their governance structures and in terms of uh, uh, their technical capabilities. And once that is done, we, we know that the knowledge and learning process is going to help us assess the risk uh, of VBDs, uh, and we are also going to be able to conduct research, and through that we will be able to understand uh, the One Health uh, system completely in terms of the transmission dynamics, particularly of zoonotic diseases. That will also uh, allow us to be able to assess the threat. So it will also be a cyclic process which starts from planning through to evaluation and adapting. So this is what we hope to be doing in the next one year. So we are also going to be using some products of Mabisa to develop our transdisciplinary methodology. I've already shown you this framework, and uh, I believe that uh, if we add zoonotic dimension within that framework, we will be able to come up with a, a methodology that actually operationalizes uh, the One Health uh, concept. Uh, finally, we will be able to come up with a logic model for operationalizing One Health in South Africa. Uh, and we are focusing on uh, uh, the problem of VBDs related challenges at the nexus of human, animal and environmental health in the Nguavuma community in South Africa. Uh, we will actually uh, have several inputs. Uh, most important, we want to establish a transdisciplinary team and we want to look at our retrospective data uh, and uh, we will also look at contemporary and prospective uh, data to as inputs to this framework. 
we will be working in uh, several working groups uh, and we should be able to have uh, a theory of change that will inform our activities. So in terms of activities, we'll have a comprehensive literature search. We'll do a meta-analysis based on uh, uh, searched literature and we will have theory based and experimental training and uh, mentorship. Uh, we'll operationalize the identified working groups and uh, we'll have stakeholder consultations. We believe that uh, out of that work, uh, we'll have uh, several publications. We'll have a One Health Metrics uh, for Inguavuma community and we will be able to come up with police briefs. Uh, that we can pass on for policy formulation to our stakeholders. Uh, we will be able to come up with uh, a next generation uh, of transdisciplinary methodology champions, uh, just as we did uh, earlier on for uh, the Mabisa project. We believe that for the One Health concept, we will be able to develop a good cadre of researchers. Uh, we will also have uh, theory on One Health transdisciplinary informed by a consortium wide inputs and outputs. In other words, our results will feed into those that will come from Kenya, Tanzania and uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. So the outcomes are going to be an operationalized One Health based uh, scorecard for VBDs including zoonotic diseases and we would like to come up with a course on transdisciplinary methodology to actually make sure that the ideas that we develop can be sustained. So I talked about the working groups and uh, this uh, would be one, uh, the, we want to pursue movement ecology given that we are actually operating in an area where uh, South Africa board is, shares borders with Mozambique and Swaziland. Uh, Anthropocene is also an interesting dimension in the sense that we really would like to see how uh, the human interference in the, in the, in the, in the environment is actually uh, influencing uh, disease outcomes or in general health outcomes. And um, knowledge to action is an important uh, working group in the sense that we don't want just to gather the knowledge, but we want to make sure that the information that we gather is going to be useful to the community. And uh, community engagement is uh, one aspect that uh, will make all the projects a success. And so we will want to, you know, solicit and engage and uh, integrate the views and concerns of the different stakeholders uh, into our projects. Uh, and finally, uh, the, we think that a capacity development working group is uh, very important in making sure that what we are working on now will be sustained for years to come. So gender and social equity will be mainstreamed throughout all these uh, working groups. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I would like to acknowledge uh, the KZN Eco Health Program uh, team members uh, who are constituted of uh, our communities, our stakeholders, our researchers, uh, and our students. We include also both postgraduate students and postdoctoral fellows. Not forgetting our funders, our facilitator, uh, and the conference convener for this conference. Thank you all for listening. Have a good day. My presentation is on operationalizing the One Health approach, building on the TDR-IDRC Africa Initiative project on malaria and Rift Valley fever in Kenya. My name is Benson Estambale, team leader of Team Kenya. Some background to this project. Between 2013 to 2017, the International Development Research Center, IDRC Canada, through WHO and TDR, funded a project entitled Population Health Vulnerabilities to Vector-Borne Diseases, Increasing Resilience Under Climate Change Conditions in Africa. 
The project in turn sponsored five other projects spreading across seven African countries. And uh, the countries are indicated in this map right from West African, uh, West African countries through the Eastern African countries and the Southern African countries. In Kenya, the project was titled Early Warning Systems for Improved Human Health and Resistance to Climate Sensitive Vector-Borne Diseases. Data collection was done both quantitatively and qualitatively. For qualitative, gender segregated uh, focus group discussions and key informant interviews were used. This slide shows the various activities related to FGDs and the key informant interviews, including visits to marketplaces to assess the traditional medicine that is being used in this area, as well as the abattoirs, where a lot of slaughters uh, of animals are done. For results, key highlights for Rift Valley fever included the prevalence in animal samples of 5.6% during the inter-epidemic period and zero prevalence in human samples. Community knowledge on etiology, transmission and symptoms of Rift Valley fever in both humans and animal was low, that is 18%. High risk community practices for increased exposure to Rift Valley included consumption of products from sick animals, poor disposal of animal and dead animals, including aborted fetuses, traditional treatment of sick animals instead of uh, allowing the uh, veterinarians to do their work, poor waste disposal from slaughterhouses, and certified indigenous uh, methods of meat inspections, such as uh, throwing a piece of spleen from a slaughtered animal to ants to feed on. And if they feed on it, then the rest of the meat is good. If they don't, then it is not good. Uh, on malaria, there was a seasonal malaria transmission. And the baseline prevalence among school children was 10.5% in wet seasons and 2.6% in dry seasons. Community knowledge on malaria transmission by mosquitoes was high. And like uh, what we saw in uh, Rift Valley fever, management of malaria involved both traditional and conventional methods. Uh, and I, further analysis of the, uh, the, the, the results identified some gaps, which we have listed here for uptake through the One Health approach. Uh, these gaps, we have divided them into three uh, subsystems. There is the human subsystem where uh, we found limited dissemination of information concerning zoonotic diseases, particularly Rift Valley fever in that region, limited community engagement and no communication fr framework for Rift Valley fever. There was also lack of coordination between public health and veterinary officers. There was also limited capacity for training of local point persons on Rift Valley fever management, low public and community awareness and education to demystify myths associated with malaria and Rift Valley fever, and no budget allocations for in-service training or continuous professional development. For the animal subsystem, Animals and animal products going to markets for sale were not inspected by the veterinarians and public health officers. Inadequate inspection of meat through public health department. Lack of protective gear for slaughterhouse operators. Indigenous knowledge on disease transmission and seasonality was not adequately incorporated into use. For the environment subsystem, there was limited knowledge on effects of climate variability on risks of transmission of malaria and Rift Valley fever. And there was a gap in the knowledge of seasonality of transmission of Rift Valley fever. Uh, these two slides uh, clearly indicating what happens during the wet season in the area and uh, the extreme dry season as well in the same area.
Now, what are the strategies for the next phase of operationalizing the One Health approach? Now, beyond the TDR-IDRC initiative, WHO convened a stakeholders meeting in Brazzaville, Congo, last year in December. The stakeholders included the four principal investigators of the TDR-IDRC research initiative. In this meeting, it was agreed that to articulate further the fundamentals of One Health analysis of research products from the TDRI-DRC initiative be carried out in each of the project in order to align and contribute to the strategic action plan on health and environment in Africa. For us in Kenya, we came up with the, a project titled Operationalizing the One Health Approach, Building on the TDR-IDRC Africa Initiative on Malaria and Rift Valley Fever. The overall objective of our project is to contribute to the operationalization of One Health Protocol for Implementation Research, drawing on the findings and experience from the TDR-IDRC. Our specific objectives are three. One is to synthesize the existing project data based on the One Health approach guided by the principles of socio-ecological systems framework. Two is to build capacity of the specific team and other stakeholders on One Health approach to climate sensitive vector-borne diseases. And three is to publish synthesized research papers based on the One Health approach, which incorporates finding from the project. Our plan is to integrate our research findings using One Health multi and transdisciplinary systems approach, including scorecard and metrics based on evaluation for its operationalization. For this, we have uh, adopted a logic model for operationalizing the One Health Initiative for Malaria and Rift Valley Fever. In this model, we have uh, a problem which is to create a transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary method for operationalizing the One Health for vector-borne disease control and prevention using the One Health metric and scorecards. Uh, we will have inputs, activities, outputs, and eventually outcomes. In the inputs, we have a multidisciplinary team drawn from the different uh, team specialization. Two, we have the project data and the literature from similar projects and uh, we will synthesize this information. Three, uh, there will be orientation on the concept of One Health and transdisciplinarity. Four, uh, there will be a research plan and methodology. Five, there will be sector representatives from the national government, the local government, which is Baringo uh, County, human health, animal health, environmentalists, and climate sectors. Uh, six, we will have uh, involvement of other partners, including the Zoonotic Disease Unit of the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Agriculture, and other partners like the Horn Project, which is in the Horn of Africa, including Kenya. Uh, we will have an uh, online platform, and of course, we will uh, expect to get uh, support in terms of funding from WHO. Act our activities will be data review, literature search, and review of related project reports. Perform a stakeholder analysis through inception and review workshops with the project teams and stakeholders from the region. Train the project team and local stakeholders on One Health and One Health scorecard. Hold write workshops to develop publications based on One Health regular project and periodic stakeholder meetings. Form thematic groups in liaison with the other projects. Access information and material on the project from the online platform once it is set up. It is expected that we'll have outputs from this. One will be publications on operationalizing of One Health in the Kenyan project. We will also expect to develop a project theory of change, a One Health metrics and scorecards, trained 
project team and master trainers selected from the stakeholders on how to operationalize One Health in vector borne diseases, a project synthesized report, and a linkage with the other One Health projects in the Kenyan context. Our outcomes are mainly two. One is that we will have a One Health operationalized for VBD control and prevention in the context of climate change. And two is a, broad, a broader application of the One Health operationalization to zoonosis and other emerging or re-emerging infections, including COVID-19. For this, the Kenyan team is available and is here, uh, led by myself, and these are my colleagues. To end, we would like to acknowledge the following partners, WHO TDR, Foundation Meru, the WHO Regional Office for Africa, special team, research teams, consultants, and facilitators, the county government, the national government, policy and decision makers, and communities of Baringo County. Thank you very much. It is my pride and pleasure to introduce the next speaker in this panel, Professor Paul Simon Wokiza. Paul is a professor of immunology at Sokoin University of Agriculture in Tanzania, where he leads a research group on vector-borne diseases at the Genome Science Center. Paul has contributed research towards the understanding of the relationships between people, livestock, disease, and rural livelihoods at human, livestock, wildlife interface ecosystems. Aside from research, Paul is passionate on capacity building for the next generation of African scientists. Colleagues, please welcome Professor Paul Guakiza. Hello, my name is Paul Guakisa. I am a professor in Sokoine University of Agriculture in Tanzania, and I would like to present to you about my project titled Operationalizing One Health to Vector Bone Diseases in Maasai Communities in Simanjiro, Tanzania, Building Capacity for Transdisciplinary Research. This work is supported by the World Health Organization through its uh, TDR program. The background to this work was another project which I conducted as principal investigator with several researchers during 2013 to 2018. And the title of that ended project was Predicting Vulnerability and Improving Resilience of Maasai Communities to Vector-Borne Infections Using an Eco-Health Approach in the Maasai Ecosystem. The aim of that project was to increase resilience of Maasai pastoralists to trypanosomiasis in the context of climate change as well as land use. Trypanosomiasis is a sessile borne disease, also known as sleeping sickness in humans. Over 6 million people are at risk in several countries in Africa. The Maasai people in particular are vulnerable to this disease, which is regarded as endemic, neglected, but also zoonotic. So we have been working in an area called the Maasai Steppe, which is in northern Tanzania, bordering with Kenya. This is an area which is characterized by a large human livestock wildlife interface, and many disease vectors exist here. So diseases, vectors, people, animals, climate issues, as well as large biodiversity seen in this area. So this makes the Maasai step a very suitable platform for studying issues of One Health, more so for operationalizing One Health. So a word about One Health in a nutshell. So much has been written about One Health and it is well understood that uh, this is a collaborative, it's a multi-sectoral and transdisciplinary approach that brings together research capacity 
from human and animal health sectors with the goal to achieve optimal health outcomes for people, animals, and their shared environment. However, despite many supporting works on One Health, for example, touching zoonotic diseases, still gaps exist between veterinary and human medical research. Gaps also exist between health sciences and environmental or social sciences or sustainability sciences, if you like. So myself from Tanzania and other partners from other countries in Africa and elsewhere, with support from the World Health Organization, TDR, we would like to explore a transdisciplinary methodological approach to build a metrics-based framework in order to operationalize One Health using vector-borne diseases in the context of climate change in Africa as a model. Having said that, we have put forward three objectives. Objective number one is to build capacity for transdisciplinary research at different levels for operationalizing One Health. So the levels, we are talking about community level, including extension workers, level of young researchers, early beginning scientists, and thirdly, the level of policy makers. Our second objective is to use a theory of change approach to address key One Health-based problems among the vulnerable communities in Simanjiro area. Such problems could be, for example, sanitation and livelihoods, or the human-animal interface and zoonotic diseases, etc., etc. And the third objective is to collaboratively develop a metrics-based assessment of a One Health scorecard. Having worked in different villages in Maasai communities in northern Tanzania, we came up with several exciting results. Here, I would like to present two of those. Number one, we found that Maasai people have limited knowledge and their awareness of the disease sleeping sickness. Although they knew that the sesa fly transmits trypanosomiasis to their cattle, but Maasai people were very unaware that the fly also transmits the deadly human sleeping sickness. Secondly, we were able to affirm that the trypanosome infections are seasonal, meaning that uh, in sesa flies, as well as in livestock, the trypanosome infections are highest towards end of the rainy season as you approach the dry season meaning that trypanosomiasis is climate-driven disease. This allowed us to think further that we could help the Maasai communities if we put together our climate data, ecology data, and data on prevalence of trypanosome infections. In this way, in partnership with our colleagues from the IRI, Columbia University, we were able to develop a mapping tool that allows to use a smartphone-based app to see which areas and which times of the year are more infested with SSA flies in order to help Maasai people avoid infections. These results allowed us to translate our research findings into practice towards research implementation, so as to say. So in a participatory manner, we formed community partnership groups comprising of the local Maasai people, researchers, as well as local health and local environment experts to work together to tackle local problems. So amongst the community adaptation strategies which we came up with were how we could set up traps, how we could use different chemicals, how we could control vectors, how we could do bush clearing activities, but most importantly, is how to carry knowledge about the dangers that the people exposed to in those high interface areas. Following three years of intensive community engagement, we were able to reach a wider audience. And in particular, uh, we were interested to push these results to policymakers. So we developed a policy brief, which we presented 
to a multi-sectoral policy dialogue meeting with government ministries for health, environment, and other stakeholders. And in this way, our findings were then uh, absorbed by the ministries. And this led to prioritization of uh, triparasomiasis amongst six other zoonotic diseases to be regarded as a disease of national interest. This new knowledge and a number of our exciting results were published in local media, but also in reputable international journals. So following the successful completion of the MOTHER project 2013-2018, we now see new possibilities to embark on implementation research using our data in hand, but also with the new, with the strategic thinking to provide a proof of concept for One Health, to come up with a research project that would allow to operationalize One Health in a practical way, in a dimension that could be reproduced, in a dimension that could be measurable. So in a nutshell, we think about going forward in this new project, whereby we want to employ integrative ways, supporting systems thinking, and a third of change approach to implement programmatic One Health practices. We would like to use local scenario, local perspectives, to bring together communities, researchers, government, as well as policymakers to address core One Health components in local areas. For example, ecosystems, anthropogenic processes, public health, livelihoods, etc., etc., in order to increase resilience of local communities to emerging vector-borne diseases. In our next project, which starts from this year, we would like to build on experiences and outcomes of our initial projects, but then we would like to use new strategic and programmatic models so that we can provide proof of evidence or proof of the concept of, of One Health. For this matter, it will be important to design strategically, but also to document the methodological processes for operationalizing One Health at community level. In so doing, we would like to highlight best practices for possible replication elsewhere. But most importantly, capacity building will be a prime activity, capacity building at different levels for the purpose of wider knowledge sharing with different stakeholders. And the following is our proposed logical model for operationalizing One Health in Tanzania. So firstly, we have identified the problem already. This is how to promote innovative and inclusive community engagement to operationalize One Health in vulnerable pastoral communities in the Maasai areas. Our inputs, multidisciplinary research teams, which are already in place, data, knowledge, and experience from the previous project, which is also in our hands, research funding, which is already forthcoming from the World Health Organization, an online platform, which uh, will be developed as we continue the, with activities. We're gonna have stakeholders from different sectors, but uh, most importantly, new knowledge related to our theme and TDR partners from the WHO One Health Project. A number of activities have been earmarked in the forthcoming project. These are shown here. Literature review and synthesis is already ongoing. Review of outputs and outcomes from the previous project. This is something which is already ongoing now with our young scientists and we are looking at these things. But then as soon we look forward to have our inception workshop and embark on training at three different levels. We'll be composing thematic groups. As an example, one group could look at human livestock, wildlife interface, and zoonotic diseases. Or we could look at, say, sanitation and livelihoods. But these are things that will be discussed once we have our uh, inception meeting. So uh, outputs which are earmarked are, number one, publications, reports. We look forward to outputting trained cadre of transdisciplinary practitioners and a One Health Metrics scorecard with other partners. Outcomes of this project are articles, 
in national media for publicity and uptake, a policy brief, a document on one health operationalization, but also recommendations for transdisciplinary approaches for preparedness towards emerging zoonotic diseases and where possible COVID-19 will be cited as an example. I may not stop this presentation without acknowledging a number of partners shown on this slide who have been very instrumental in the conduct and support of this project. Thank you very much. It is my honor and privilege to introduce the final speaker in this panel, Professor Brahma Kone. Brahma is an Associate Professor of Public Health at the University Pelifloro Gon Kolibali of Korogo, Cote d'Ivoire. He is also an Associate Researcher and Project Leader at CSRS in Abidjan as well as Deputy Director for Research Programs of the country's Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research. Brahma's research interests include water, sanitation and hygiene, and associated health risks, as well as climate change adaptation, with a focus on eco-health and integrated health risk assessment. Colleagues, please welcome Professor Brahma Kone. One of the projects from the previous TDR-RDFC initiative on VBDs and climate change was on vulnerability and resilience to malaria and chistosomiasis on the Sahelian belt of Africa. This project used eco-health methodology. And from this one, we plan to operationalize one health approach in West Africa with the new project of POA for operationalizing one health in West Africa. The output from the TDR RDRC initiative on VBDs and climate change represents a significant advance toward meeting the urgent and critical needs to place the science and practice health in relation to the environment on more of an evidence-based footing. Beside the initiative extensive research finding on specific diseases, mainly on zoonotic diseases challenge, using the ecosystemic approach to health methodology, the foundation it led provide an extraordinary opportunity to further enhance approaches to stakeholders' participation, including community engagement, inter- and transdisciplinary project management, and supporting policies. TDR then supports the idea of using One Health approach to conduct implementation research based on the outcome and lesson learned so far from the previous initiative. Of note, one health approach are embedded in two eco-health conceptual thinking, which are further expanded to health in socio-ecological systems, addressing complex issues of human environment system. Eco-health principles are the following. System thinking, knowledge to action, transdisciplinarity, participation, equity and sustainability. And we know that four integrated subsystems influence health, which are social subsystem, political subsystem, ecological subsystem, and economic subsystems. EcoHealth then help understand those complex socio-ecological, political, and economic systems. Using One Health will help better understand and manage health at the human, animal, and environment interface.
The main research question is how to create standardized and measurable transdisciplinary methodology or approach integrating One Health to tackle zoonotic and other socio-environmental diseases drawing on the ended EcoHealth Research Project. The present table synthesizes how One Health for VBD's control can be operationalized while looking at vector abundance with the objective of reducing vector longevity. What can be done at human and animal interface could be the application of chemicals or traps and at the environment interface one can manage ecosystem or environment, or environment to reduce seasonal survival. While looking at infectious pools as a risk factor with the objective of preventing the diseases, what can be done at human and animal interface can be vaccination of human or animals. And at the environment interface, infrastructural development to prevent the completion of transmission cycle to or from the vector can be done. And while looking, for example, at the infectious exposure as a risk factor, with the objective of reducing the potentially infectious events, what can be done at human and animal interface may be the application of vector repellents. And at the environment interface, it can be environmental management to avoid exposure. So coming now to our project implemented in West Africa, the so-called vulnerability and resilience to malaria and chisomiasis at the northern and southern fringe of the Sahel Ben in a context of climate change project. The main objectives were to describe the morbidity due to malaria and chisomiasis as well as the socio-economic, environmental, and socio-sanitary determinants in the context of climate change. The second objective was to analyze the relationship between socio-ecological and climatic systems and the transmission of malaria and chisomiasis. The third and last objective was to develop on a participative basis adapted tools and strategies of resilience to malaria and chisomiasis, taking into account the current and future effect of climate change on the diseases. Some outputs from this project can be presented here. We were able to come out with scientific papers showing new evidence on the diseases. We come out with theses, master theses and PhDs we come out with policy brief to help decision makers implement solutions that were designed for them. We also come out with newsletter, newspaper article in order to inform communities, overall communities. And we were able to implement stakeholders' capacity building activities. As you can see on those pictures, the first picture on the top was a sensitization campaign with elders in one of the um, city of the project in Korogo, in Northern Cote d'Ivoire. And the photo you can see in the middle was also a sensitization campaign of school age children at their schools. And the third picture you can see was motorbikes that were given to women in charge of collecting waste in household in order to help them improve the living conditions of communities. From these outputs, we want to operationalize one health approach through the assessment of capacity building need per stakeholders, activities and outcome of knowledge and learning process and risk management strategies drawing on our projects. The first specific objective 
is to analyze the actors and resource building on those involved in the previous project, the so-called MTVCC project, to analyze the capacity building activities and their outcomes, employing socio-ecological system analytical method and stakeholder analysis. The second specific objective will be to assess the effectiveness of the eco-health approach principle implementation in achieving one health implementation intervention science and risk management scorecard components. The third specific objective is to investigate how the previous project, MTVCC project, result and experience with malaria and chisodomyosis interventions and the role of public versus private health facilities could guide interventions to improve health system disease risk management capacity considering one health approach taking as example the zoonotic disease COVID-19 pandemic management and from there we plan to produce a documentary video on lesson learned from the previous initiative for operationalizing the One Health approach. How will we do what we plan to do? This table synthesizes the main inputs, method or activities, the main outputs, and the source of verification from each of our specific objectives. When we focus on the specific objective two, assess the effectiveness of eco-health principle implementation, the inputs will be the project dissertations, being master or PhD reports, the publication and other documents. The input will also be project team members, all other stakeholders that were involved in the project. And the method and activities will be document review, other literature review, paper writing workshop, and participation to thematic working group of the ongoing initiative. And we expect to come out with a proof of concept validating the One Health Scorecard intervention science and risk management component from our MTVCC project. And of course, the source of verification will be the project report, the scientific publication we will make, and the workshop report. When we take the last specific objective, produce a documentary video, the input will be the project stakeholders, the previous project stakeholders, the recorded video that were made while implementing the previous project, the other project leaders and team members from the ongoing initiatives are also involved. And the activities will be the video recording with researchers and other project stakeholders in Cote d'Ivoire and Mauritania on project implementation process and lesson learned from operationalizing the One Health Scorecard. And the main output will be a video documentary. Let's end our presentation by presenting the main team members. Our team will be made of researchers, a transdisciplinary team with epidemiologists, social scientists, biologists, environmental researchers, with community and community leaders, who will be also working with the Ministry in Charge of Health, with the Ministry in Charge of Sanitation and Wellbeing, and with all local decision makers. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much to all the speakers and panelists for this session entitled A Metrics-Based Evaluation of One Health Towards Control of Vector-Borne Diseases in the Context of Climate Change. I hope the audience have found the presentations useful and also benefit from the exchanges in the questions and answers. I'd like to take this time now to conclude this session and leave us all with the following messages and highlights from our speakers. Today, we have learned that a metrics-based evaluation of one health system is central because you can manage what you can measure. For this, 
it's imperative to clearly identify and articulate the fundamentals of One Health at the human-animal-environmental interface and within a given health subsystem to bridge these fundamentals from theory to practice towards One Health operationalization. The use of One Health fundamentals as the basis of core capacities and capabilities, knowledge and skill development in One Health for both research and implementation. The importance of the One Health adapted management process to evaluate the model in the real world and how the projects from the TDR, ID, RC, African Initiative are laying the ground to pilot this model. Moving forward, through pilot projects among vulnerable populations in Africa, those carried out in a Ivory Coast, Kenya, Mauritania, South Africa, and Tanzania, we hope to achieve these next steps. To further develop a One Health methodological framework, to refine criteria for multi-sectoral cross-disciplinary collaboration and integration, to develop a One Health integrated implementation research methodology, and to build capacity for a metrics-based evaluation of of One Health, from model to practice. Once more, thank you very much for your kind attention and participation to this session. We wish you a very good day to everyone. Thank you. <laughs>